Nelson. I'm the founder of Next Tribe, and we love to have great guests to talk to really accomplished, fun women. And we usually do it on Thursday evenings. And this Thursday, we have Maggie Rowe, who is just fascinating for her background. She's been an actress. She's been a, a, a writer. She's written comedy for, for TV. And she's written, this is your second book, right? That's out. Yes. That's called, if you're wondering, look behind me. It's Easy Street. And it, it's kind of a catchphrase it, within the book that, that'll make you laugh when you every time you hear it. Um, so let me read you a little bit about Maggie, because and then we're going to get she's going to read us a little bit from the book. Um, let me say so Maggie is a writer performer in L.A. and she lives with her husband and dog who are part of the book. She started out as an actress and then shifted her focus to writing. She's written screenplays for several films, including Bright Day and Out West, for TV shows, including Flaked and Arrested Development, created stage productions, Hollywood Hell House, Hollywood Purity Ball, Lawyer Cop Doctors, and Pretty Good Show, edited a book of personal essays, Dirty Laundry, mm, and founded her own religion. Oh my God, we're going to hear all about this. This is too, too much. And she's produced and performed regularly a spoken word show, Sit and Spin. Is that what it's called? Oh my God, at the Comedy Central Stage. That is great. And her, her last book is uh, Sin Bravely, a memoir of spiritual disobedience. And that was published in 2017. Her new book is Easy Street, a story of redemption from myself. Welcome uh, so much, Maggie. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me, Jeannie. That's quite a that's a quite a varied uh, resume, and I always like that about I like that about women at this age. A lot, you know, we've done so much, and we've accumulated wisdom and and humor, and so much so much to uh, to there's so much meat to work from, right? I you know I've I've changed in looking at it as a positive thing that I've done all of these different things. I haven't followed a particular track with the particular trajectory that I've sometimes lamented. But I find that my friends, my, my lady friends especially are hyphenates and they've switched and they've maneuvered and they've uh, developed themselves in different ways. But and, yes. I, and I've always thought that, that we should all have several careers. We shouldn't just be one thing through life. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I, I, I did have a stint as a lavender farmer to really get me off course, but, but afterwards, uh, as a lounge performer. Yeah. Lavender oh. farmer, farmer. So that, oh. that was my big diversion. But anyway, you've had, you had founding your own re religion. I guess that's pretty big diversion. <laughs> I mean, uh, side, side tangent. So, um, do you want to start off with reading a little bit from the book and then we can go from there? Yes, so I'm going to read the very beginning. Uh, just we have two minutes. Okay, uh, so I am not a nice person. I am going to admit that right here and now. I mean, I look nice. I behave nicely. I do nice things all the time. And the people who know me mostly think I'm one of the nicest people that they know. But I'm not. I do have a nice life. That's for sure on my wealth paved street where famous Southern California sunshine filters down through sheltering sycamores and long trunked palm trees where jasmine and birds of paradise bloom all year round. Wait, I will question myself on a walk into town gazing up through the tropical foliage. Am I on vacation? It can take me a second to get my bearings. Oh no, <laughs> I catch myself. That's right, I live in Los Angeles now. Even 25 years removed from a Midwestern family's modest Midwestern roots, it takes me by surprise. I guess I'll always feel like a bit of a fish out of water on these leafy enchanted streets. A nasty fish, as it happens though, because despite these rather fortunate circumstances, I am not content, I am not grateful, I am envious, in fact, and on my daily errands and afternoon musings on the patio by my pool, in the privacy of my mind, behind my mask of friendship and kindness, I cultivate my envy like an exotic plant. Everybody, I am increasingly convinced, not just in Los Angeles, but everywhere in the world is better off than me. I am missing out. 
I feel on the good stuff, all the good stuff, the real juice of life, that single malt elixir that makes the endless bullshit of being human worth it. And everybody else is slurping it up right in front of me. You might ask why. How could I possibly not be pleased with a lovely Los Angeles life on a lovely street with palm fronds and flowering jasmine swaying in the temperate breeze? I ask myself the same question a lot. <laughs> well, that, that's a great start. And I, I, I you know, I, I think it's funny because I, I read a lot of memoirs and stuff, but people don't necessarily admit to being not nice. So why did you decide that? Why did you start out with that? Well, uh, first of all, I think envy of the seven deadly sins is the one that people are least likely to admit. Mm. All the other ones have some sex appeal, they get some glory, they get some press, but envy, that's the, that's the sniggly little... Uh, that is, it's stuff. true, that's a good point. And why do you think that is? Because it is, what does it say about us if we, if we admit to being envious? I think it is, it is what makes us feel smallest to admit mm -hmm. that in our secret, secret, darkest selves, we want what somebody else has. Like yeah. that's worse than wanting to kill them or eat them. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. But, but how, how can you be in LA and not feel that? That's what I want to know. I mean, that's I feel like it really, like talking about the leafy, I just feel like it is everywhere in here. And, and socializing is connected with networking and you read what people are making and the trades and what deals they got. And uh, I really did find myself after living here, really getting into that thing of just every time I met somebody, sizing up how I ranked in the mm -hmm. hierarchy. And I, the impetus for this book um, was even before, before I had my mental health crisis and even before I became one of the main characters in this book's legal guardian. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually the big part of the book. But before that happened, this book was just going to be called I Am Not Nice. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so it really was a bit of a turn. And the impetus was, I know we're all doing this. You know, I, everyone around me, it's just in my culture. And I, and my mission was to go, God, let's just say, this is what's going on. And then it doesn't get subverted into, you know, your real schadenfreude or your wishing right. for someone's failure. You know, it's when you suppress it, then it gets a little rancid. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I think it seems to me reading the book that you started that way because you wanted the the project or not the project but the role you took on with Sunny and Joanna who are two of the main characters I guess you wanted to make sure people didn't think you were writing this as look at me I'm so great or whatever is that was that part of it so true um because and even and I talk about it in the book I I became a neurodiverse woman's uh legal representative at, at a point, and I did not do it uh, to be a nice person. It got, I got thrust into the situation. And even continuing doing it, I really tried to be honest with myself, you know, and poke holes in my own story and be like, why are you really doing this? I mean, not in a mean way, but it satisfies um, a sense of how I perceive myself. I'm a lady who extends herself beyond <laughs> what is expected. Um, not having children afforded me the time to do it. And I think I was also feeling a lack of a feeling of being isolated. So I talk about the endeavor from all these different angles. Yes, to avoid. <laughs> and that's probably image maintenance too, is that's keeping everyone thinking that I'm nice of being like, trust me, I know that. <laughs> I'm gonna get here first. <laughs> I'm gonna say it before you say it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's so. Uh, first of all, I also want to tell everyone who's here watch, watching that please um, write any questions in the chat, and I'll call on you afterwards. But I want to say this is a book for. I mean, first it's it's funny, 
but it's a book for anybody who's ever struggled with some kind of mental, you know, having a moment, anxiety, depression, whatever. It's not just that, of course, it's, there's a real plot and a, and a, you know, a, and character development and all that. And it's a memoir, so there, but there's character development and beautiful juxtapositions that you're like, wow, this ama is an amazing thing. But I just, I was telling um, Maggie before we started that there were parts of this when you were describing your own, your mental health issues, where I was almost in tears because I identified with it so much. It was so honest, so like just out there. And I was so grateful to know, I was so grateful to know that you'd been through that. No, I was grateful to know that somebody had actually been through that and was able to express it so well. So did, did you, um, how did you, did you take notes during your crisis or what? I definitely did. I'm such a journaler, note taker. So basically my particular struggle is a form of OCD that's sometimes called pure O, which makes it sound, I think, very elegant. You know, I, I don't have all the trappings of that C in there, uh, but it's the obsessive version without the physical compulsion. And the way that it manifested in my life as a child, and then it was a resurgence of it, was when I would tell myself not to say a certain word, that word would come up in my head and it would create kind of this feedback loop. Um, uh, it started off, I grew up as an evangelical Christian and I was told that, you know, you wouldn't go to hell, God would forgive you unless you did the one unforgivable sin. And that was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So of course we were all like, what is that? We gotta not do it. And the answer was, we don't know. So it was like, wow, what is it? And um, it created this, this uh, feedback loop in my head where I was like, don't say blaspheme, Maggie, don't say it. And then as soon as I would say it, or I you know, would say bad things about you, you know, things that I wouldn't want to say, but the prohibition created the violation um, mm. is how I think of it. And you have to get rid of the prohibition uh, be before you can uh, short circuit the whole thing. Well, uh, the original blaspheme thing, when I got out of my particular brand of evangelical Christianity, that went away, but somehow uh, this process morphed into a weirder and kind of slippier beast um but it was the same mechanism and, yeah and do you okay so there is a the there is some pair there are parallels in here and juxtapositions and all that i was saying but so let's i was going to ask you questions about the your mental health part but before let's start let's talk introduce joanna and sunny they're they're yes. the impetus for a lot of, of i mean there's like the the meat of the story. So tell us about, about them. Well, my husband, who is extremely gregarious, he was a stand-up comic and he's not a snarky stand-up comic. He is a talk to everyone and a very, he's very generous with his humor. Uh, he met a mother and daughter who were outside of our local chicken place and he gave them some money to get a meal. And then he would regularly see them, this mother and daughter, Sonny and Joanna, at this corner, and he would just take them to lunch. And then over a period of years, they just kind of folded into our lives in, a, in small ways. So they would come over here for holidays, for Halloween, or you know, my husband wrote on the Golden Girls, and they both loved the Golden Girls. So when there was a Golden Girls marathon, they would come over. Um, so, you know, so they were in our lives, but I would say like a, a spice. <laughs> uh, and, and then an, an event happens. Um, uh, well, I can, it's not like it's a bit. Uh, I, the mother dies. And when she does, the daughter doesn't know anybody except for me and my husband. So we are in the position of becoming a caretaker for a woman who has not taken care of herself in the past. Uh, so it's challenging, but that challenge ends up being the thing that kind of helps me out of the um, echo chamber of my own uh, mental health crisis. 
And and so did, did your involvement with her, with uh, Joanna and especially Joanna, was it just, it's just incremental. It wasn't like we're taking her in. It was more uh, like. No, it was very incremental until Sunny, until the mother died. And then it was like, oh, you know, because uh, Joanna hadn't shopped for herself or plea, you know, all those basic uh, kind of things. So in that way, that was a kind of sudden event. And uh, at the time I was, and I still do, but uh, I was feeling a real pining uh, for uh, lack of motherhood that I had not chosen to be a mother. And so there's a some comedic irony in that I don't get this bouncing baby girl, I get this um, older woman who, and this is a little comedic angle too, uh, is in love with my husband, yeah. Jim. Yeah, um, she, is. <laughs> she calls him handsome Jim. And uh, so it, it, was, it wasn't quite the, uh, the child that I picked, but it was in some ways. Uh, right, right. You have some great scenes with, you know, mother shopping with her daughter while you're with Joanna, which are just great material, I mean, uh, and, and real and uh, poignant. Um, but I just, I just wonder, the, the, she said, and, and Joanna even says it at times when like, when you talk about your own, when you finally talk to her about your own mental health issues, she's, and she's the one that gave the title, right? She's always like, you're on easy street. A handsome Jim lets you live in his house. And you what, what, what? So she, it, it, what I see it as, kind of like, okay, the difference if somebody who can afford treatment has access to treatments and has had nurture, you know, a family or a supportive group network, the difference, like, did you ever think by the grace of God or something there, but the, there by the grace of God, when you looked at Joanna? Totally. Uh, yeah, I think we are, because at times we would really seem very close. She repeats words out loud. I repeat them in my head. We're, we're only five years apart in age. Uh, there was one moment where I was on a real cocktail of psychotropic medication and I was trying to get her in for an examination. And, you know, I just looked over, it was like, the line is really, really very thin in some ways, but the big chasm is, um, I, I know it's a buzzword these days, privilege, but I, I have net, I have always been able to get whatever mental health treatments I've wanted. <laughs> you know, I've always had insurance. Uh, my dad was an insurance agent. <laughs> uh, so it was a, a total give it. So, and it's a different situation for her. I had the nurturing of an education. I had two parents that were mentally capable. Uh, you know, so, so there's, there's quite a bit of difference, but during this time, there was it was it was small at times <laughs> yeah no i know i know it, and then and what a what a, a way to explore i mean and it really had this isn't a novel it all really happened so it's like it didn't but what a way to explore that can the the real impact of mental health or the and the lack of resources here it's right there in front of you it's happening and um i mean you were able to and you were able to to find those I mean, I think the a real, the real gift, a real gift in writing is to be able to combine the, the just this moving, poignant stuff, but still keep that humor, so you never get too earnest, or it doesn't. It just yes, it, there's yes. a real that's a so hard to do, and you did it. So I'm gonna just say thank you. You really, really pulled it off. And um, I guess one of my questions too is, is this then a natural follow up? I didn't read your first book, Sin Bravely. But is this kind of a natural, I mean, a segue from that, because you, in that you talk about your Christian upbringing, right? And this is kind of like the long lasting impact of, of that. It's, it's, exactly, it's exactly what it is, yeah. Um, and I'm certainly much healthier than I was. Uh, the first book took place uh, when I was 19, I checked myself into an evangelical psychiatric facility, which sounds like, what do those exist? Uh, and there was a pro I mean, the inherent problem with a place like that, their slogan was psychiatry where the Bible comes first. So of course they've they've set out right away what their 
uh, priorities in terms of care are. But I also got this wonderful advice from a wonderful therapist, and it's the title of that book, but it's a phrase of Martin Luther's, and, and the phrase is, sin bravely in order to know the forgiveness of God. Wow. And I had kind of a radical uh, therapist there who said, you got to stop worrying about God forgiving you. The only thing that you're going to do to get out of it, go sin all the sins you want to do everything, whatever you want to do, go do them. Um, which I sort of think of him as an undercover agent in that place. Like in retrospect, I wow. wonder. Subversive. You know, it's like, were you, you know, but, but it was still within the framework of Christianity. It was a, it was a Martin Luther phrase. It was, it even had a, it was a doctrine, the doctrine of Pekka Fortiter, the brave what? sin. The brave, <laughs> yeah. the brave sin, yes. Sin so, bravely, that sounds like age boldly, which is our tagline. <laughs> no, it's exactly what it reminded me of. I was just telling you, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it was kind of, and it's really what I needed. And it helped me kind of get to where I was. But I think those seeds are, you know, they just, they came back up again. Uh, but this time I had, even though it was a really, really rough year and a half, um, uh, I had a lot more tools and I had a lot more strength. Right, um, right. Um, well, I, I have so many questions. I don't know where, 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 to, start, where to start, but um, what is it that you want people to, when they finish reading it, is there something you want them to know or feel uh, from this book, from the Easy Street books? Yes, I would say the two things that is I, I feel like there's this, you know, I think envy is a little bit of an epidemic now is kind of the age of envy with Facebook and you can see billionaire, you know, you can see all these people's lifestyle and the idea that everyone's life, if, if not really difficult is bittersweet. Mm. Um, and so at its best, <laughs> um, I, I feel like, and, and so the book ends, um, I don't get what I want, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, I, I just, this, this idea of peeling back the mask and for people like Joanna that would look at my life and Joanna's the extreme, um, she says, you know, it must be nice. It must be nice to live on easy street. It must be nice to live on easy street with handsome Jim where you can <laughs> meet the celebrities that you want to meet. <laughs> like this, this idea of easy street. Um, but I wanted to peel back the curtain on that a little bit. Um, and also the idea I heard it within a type of Christian framework that it was not helpful to me when I was growing up, which was be nice to other people. That's the way to help yourself, you know, get out of yourself, stop thinking of it. And I, I was taught it in a way that was a scold and a reprimand um, and not an invitation, <laughs> you know, and I really did find like, it's not bullshit that during this mental health crisis, the idea of having something that pulled me out of myself that really needed to be done, that was not bullshit, um, uh, that really did help me. Uh, so the way that I think of it is that like, not to tell yourself, oh, you should do something nice to somebody else for somebody else, but it's a Buddhist phrase that I like, but that I am the beneficiary of my own actions mm. and that if I am kind to others, I really am receiving that. And, and to think of it in terms of self-preservation rather than, I've never said this before, but I like it. Think of it in terms of self-preservation rather than obligation. Um, and, and then you're thinking about yourself as including others rather than this, I gotta do that, I gotta do this, I should, I should. There's this guy watching and somebody's, keeping tabs and now I'm keeping tabs on myself and comparing. Right. Um, I think you make a, a, you talk about that really well. Like some of the times where in my mind, when you're getting these calls from Joanna, while you're going through your own thing, I think I get anxious for you. Like, how did you handle that? But then you make the point that it really took you, you, you stopped thinking, you stopped doing this, the, the thing in your head. And I think that was, that's really a beautiful Point and a beautiful uh, idea that that and, and you it's like 
like you say, people say that, get out of your own head, but you are actually were demonstrating it, which was, which was nice to see how it works in real life with somebody. So I'm gonna, I have, I'm gonna ask uh, Maggie a few more questions about some things coming up, but remember to write your questions. This is your chance to talk to somebody who's written for TV, who's acted in TV, who's written books, who's uh, got a spoken word show and who started her own religion. <laughs> So we have to go there now, your own religion. Tell us about that. We need to hear about that. Okay, so here's what I did. Um, it was a total dilettante move um, in my mind. Well, dilettante, I followed through with it completely. So I guess in that sense, it's not a dilettante move. But I created a religion called Purisphere. And the name came from a pyramid within a sphere. And it was basically to satirize and to do a parody of all of these Los Angeles new age, I call them prosperity theologies that are just everywhere. Like people say LA is in a spiritual place. If it, like it is, it has more opportunities <laughs> um, for somebody to tell you that they know what God wants for you or can do for, you know, it's, uh, it just comes in different terms. So uh, the slogan for my religion was, have you ever wanted something that you did not have? <laughs> and, <laughs> um, for a while, me and my partner, we, we, uh, we passed it off as a real thing. We actually got a little bit of funding to do this as kind of a performance art project. Um, but we made videos uh, with people and we would go to different events. We went to, you know, some of these like conference of religions and we would just see like just how susceptible people are to somebody promising you everything you've ever wanted. Right. Um, one of our principles was we had so much fun. We had a whole clothing line. We sold clothing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing we said was, you don't realize, but the universe is your Sky Mall catalog. <laughs> Let's get shopping. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, how does how do you spell pyramid? Pier, what pyramid is? is good. Yeah, we have a website too. It is P Y R A, like the first part of pyramid, and yeah. then sphere, like a sphere. S P H E R E. Okay. Here's so peersphere.com. We have 21 tenants. Um, and uh, we had a lot of real followers for a while. <laughs> and you didn't kind of get a head rush and, and let the, you know, the adoration get, you know, get inflate your ego and start telling people to, to, you know, pierce their big toes just to see if they do it. <laughs> well, ever since I've, ever since I did this 10 years ago, I've been obsessed with trying to get a television show on the air that has that is exactly that is uh, is a woman who starts this thing and then it starts working and people start listening to her and her little slogans that she came up with off the top of the her head people think are divine and healing and it's like well maybe they are uh but no, sounds, it, it sounds great oh, that'd be it really does. Does. i like the you know the accidental you know a uh, minister or, or whatever the accidental the accidental l ron hubbard or whatever yeah, exactly. you start off small yeah <laughs> um when we were talking bef before that we we went on uh air about your another project you hoped to, to you had wanted to get to on air and it's about women in this in our age group which is 45 plus um tell us about that because that's dear to my heart that that this age group and I just think we're all so funny and and I, I wish it would make it on on air I this was another pitch I, I did manage to sell one pilot but this isn't this year but this is another failed pilot but it was so fun it was, it was called Queens of the Sea and the idea was it was based on a book there was there's this new phenomenon where people retire onto cruise ships so rather than getting a house, you just get a cabin on one of these ships and you sail around in perpetuity. Uh, and you got everything there. So the principle, the idea was it was these three women 
who had been friends in childhood and then had prioritized other things, um, had, you know, picked men and uh, ambition and uh, all these things that didn't really satisfy their soul. And then at 65, they come back together and they're going to answer that uh, hero's call to adventure that they didn't when they were girls. And they're going to do it on the sea in beautiful places. Uh -huh. And then they're going to start their own community. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going into my pitch. <laughs> and they'd have great sex on the, on the high seas. <laughs> since they were throwing off pounds of propriety if this cabin's rocking it's a we're in rough seat exactly, exactly. all those love body type things yeah. oh my gosh well i would love i would love to see that and i i um i don't know if we were on air when when i was telling you this but i love i love when women have lots of different things they've done in their life and i love that about you and so tell us a little bit about how you get went from acting to writing and was acting what brought you like everyone else to to southern california i went to graduate school in a theater creation pro it was a cross between an acting and a writing program it was primarily acting and then when i graduated i started doing this comedy spoken word show which i eventually took over called sit and spin and I love, it's my favorite thing of my time in Los Angeles. We did it for 20 years before the pandemic. And basically the idea was you were telling a 10 to 15 minute comic story about your life where you were the butt of the joke and not somebody else. Ah. Uh, so it had to do, it had to do an introspection, you know, is a, you know, it's a confessional in nature, but comedic. And that, uh, I had a piece that I did in that that got me a pilot and different things, but that was my transition. And it was kind of a nice natural transition because I was performing my own stuff that went to writing stuff for other mm -hmm. people's stuff. This is a nice natural transition. And um, are you, uh, do you miss the, the act? Are you still trying to get any acting jobs or is that just so far behind you? Even though you are, you look like Catherine Hagel. <laughs> That's part of the book. But not as pretty. <laughs> but not as pretty. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what? I met, I know I almost, um, I'm getting sit and spin back up and going. So I'll do that again. But yes, I do miss, I don't miss any TV or film stuff. Like that never gave me the big rush. But that thing of being on stage, um, like with sit and spin, but with a group of people, there, mm. there's something really visceral and exciting that I, that I do miss. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna put a, a, some info about it. And you think you will get it up again? Because and will it be, will we, will it be virtual? I mean, will it be able to see it? So my plan is, it's what I was working on today, is uh, figuring out a place to get it up as a podcast, and then it would go along with a live show mm. so we'd have this backlog because we did it for 20 years twice so you know i got all these tapes and i'm like let's get all this stuff out there and have a live component too oh good well we will we'll want to hear when you do that because we can write about it and, and, oh, and it. i like the idea that lucy has a question lucy do you want to uh and put do you want to get on your camera or not or just ask it, maybe you've, met, maybe you've gone. Oh, there she is. Cute Lucy. Oh, wait, I'm going to read it. She might not, she might have, <laughs> she might be having problems. So she says, are you finding it harder launching this book in COVID times or in some ways easier because you can do a lot on Zoom? Harder to get the book noticed or about the same? That's a good question about what we're, what, um, you know, that is her authors. <laughs> You know, I think with this one, I had a little bit of an easier time uh, as far as getting interest. Oh, because I had a wonderful publicist, Judy Tversky. Uh, hey, also Judy. Because, <laughs> um, but, also because, but also because this book had, I think, broader interest. Um, my particular background as an evangelical Christian and even evangelical psychiatric facility 
narrowed it um, in some ways. As far as doing events, I miss doing um, like, oh, well, this is so great to be able to do this, but I would love it even more if we were all around. Uh, and like, I really enjoyed doing like traveling to book clubs. Like I thought that was so fun with the first book and that's not around anymore. So I don't know that it's hurt the, the sales or, but, but I do miss the uh, in-person stuff of it all. Yeah, I like I like performance. Well, I can so. I I can imagine. I mean, it seems like uh, you know, with your acting background, and and she did read the uh, I I listened to it on audiobook because that's what I do these days. Uh, listen, but you did such a great job reading it, and to hear your voice now and see your face as you speak, it's like, but especially when you did Joanna's talking the Joanna thing, that was just like, you know, I was like, God, did you have to practice that, that, that certain way of talking? But I did notice that as you went along, you started talking a little about your own self. You started sounding a little bit like Joanna. And I wondered if that <laughs> You know, I, it's funny, the uh, editor in there said the same thing. Oh. Uh, and, and I was like, I think it's kind of because my mind starts kind of circling more and I was yeah. like well, I'm I'm fine I was fine with that yeah yeah no it's, it was it's really interesting development and so John yeah. wants to, people thought people would be interested that Joanna did relatively well during the pandemic which yes I need to we need to talk more a little more about Joanna first my first question is did she know you're writing it and how did this did she read anything or, or how how did that work Yes, she totally knew that I was writing about it and about the book and that she's in it and that her mom is in it. Um, there was an article I wrote about the Golden Girls uh, uh, that had her picture and her mother's picture and me and Handsome Jim in it. So she was really happy uh, about that. Um, and up, I want it when they're in person readings again. I'm hoping that she'll come and participate. Oh and, my gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, tell jokes. Uh, her mother uh, told, wrote, sent in jokes to Reader's Digest as a young woman. And uh, Diana has kept that kind of tradition by she'll write out little jokes to read not to me actually but to my husband <laughs> <laughs> because she loves him uh, but I'm hoping to have her read a couple of jokes and I think that would be a cool way to have her kind of honor her mom and oh, how funny yeah. her mom really was that that's and, and I I just think it's it's also it's showing you know because next shot is about women in this age group and we tend to focus on people who are just, you know, in not focus on, but but the readers are mostly people who are doing pretty well, you know, and they're making it. And, they, and but to to really spotlight somebody who's been struggling and 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 you can't help but feel compassion. And also I was impressed with some of the things she knew and and uh, and and was able to talk about at the same time. You know, I have become more and more impressed with it. Even actually my husband and handsome Jim and I were talking about it. Even <laughs> over the last couple months, actually they're just some small little developments and John brought it up, but COVID for her, I think has made her feel more a part of society than she has ever before. Uh, she has her small television in her apartment and she is so up on all the COVID news she knows what the governor is saying. She knows what the hospital, you know, she knows the different debates. She knows, um, and one of my favorite things, um, when she got a stimulus check, I manage her money, but uh, but when the stimulus check came in, I was like, Joanna, you got a little extra money. What are you gonna do? And she said, oh, Maggie, I'm gonna die in alfresco. I'm gonna die in alfresco with Papa John. <laughs> which I just thought was like, and, and she was like, and everybody's going up, everyone's spending their, their, their stipend money, their, their stim they're spending their stimulus. And I, I just felt like she felt like she was a part of this collective. You know, We're all going through it together. Yeah. We're yeah. all going through it together and they're good times and they're bad times. And, uh, and the thing that's been 
I have it in the last little bit of my book, but even since I wrote that, it's increased a little bit is that Joanna buys gifts for Jimmy's granddaughter. Um, and every time she does it to me, it's, it's so encouraging because it's the thing that I was saying about getting out of yourself a little bit. And there she is spending her little money at Rite Aid and getting, um, you know, she'll find something with a princess on it. She'll be like, Anna likes princesses, doesn't it? You know, she likes princesses. Don't you think that she's gonna like this, Maggie? Don't you think she'll like this and tell all of her friends? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, so. that's good. Um, jo Beth, hi Jo Beth McDaniel. Can you wanna unmute and ask her your question? Jo Beth is a writer also. Yeah, and struggling with a memoir too. So um, I'm really curious uh, how much your two books, your two memoir changed between the first draft and the final published book. And also if there were any rough spots that, you know, rough patches in between those two. Yes, so I would say um, Sin Bravely, it, it was a contained period of time and I had all of the notes from the period that I was in the evangelical hospital. Uh, and so in some ways the setup and the, the, the beginning and the end was, it, it was set up for me. It wasn't going to change. So the first draft was not, I, I mean, language changed, but the, the actual thing itself really didn't. And this book was wholly going to be about envy and uh, the way comparisons make us fritter away our lives. Uh, and, and so it radically changed when I had this resurgence of my OCD and then when I became Joanna's legal guardian. Um, so the rough spots, um, so the biggest rough spot was when I, first turned in Sin Bravely uh, was when I had the resurgence of my OCD. So, so it was directly connected. Uh, so they were tied, the two books were tied very much in that sense. Uh, and I can't remember, now I'm sorry, I can't remember what about that brought on the resurgence. I can't, uh, what about getting now, the- I would love to totally know um, for my own self, this is the, what I think happened. It's the way I describe it in the, and it's my best guess is that when I first turned in Sin Bravely and I had gotten this job on a awesome TV show and I had made this movie about my religion. I never even thought, like I thought that was just a fancy that I had done. So I just felt like, oh, oh my God, everything's good. And I can just relax for a second. And it was the night that I relaxed. Um, and I just watched this documentary about J.D. Salinger. It was nothing. It was just absolute. I mean, and um, I think it was that my defenses were down. Like the go, 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 go thing had somehow kept this thing at bay. And as soon as the go, go, go was away, it just went. Mm -hmm. um, it's my best guess. Yeah. No, I wonder too, I mean, there's, you know, about not sabotage, but just like, just worried, just, this is, I don't deserve this or. Um, yeah, that could be in there too. And I also, I had been on a medication for a long time that I stopped three months prior. So that could have been it. You know, it could have been, you know, by having the book out in the world, it could be fear of God punishing me. Mm. Uh, so that whacked me down. Like I don't, I don't really know, but some, some little clusterfuck. Yeah. But that's, I think that I think that's so amazing that you were planning this book on envy and comparison, and then all this is, happens, and you get a whole new perspective on envy and comparison. It's a completely different perspective. It's just, it's just a, it's brilliant. I mean, I know it all just happened, but it was just like. It just you couldn't you couldn't make this shit up is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, totally. I was like, yeah. envy, not having kids. <laughs> yeah, my mind's exploding. You know. Yeah, right, right. So tell us what's next. What can we look for? We're gonna, you know, people here. We're gonna buy this book because seriously, fabulous writing and an amazing 
confluence of events that shed light, sheds a great light on so many human emotion. But what can we expect next? Well, maybe one of my pilots, you know, maybe a pilot will get on the air. But in the immediate future, I'm starting a podcast with a, um, a woman in Wales named Emily Garces, who I connected. She's an ex-born again as well, but she's in Wales. And we're starting, uh, it's called 50 Words for Snow. And it comes from this, you know, old wives tale that's sort of true that Inuit languages have over 50 words for snow. So we are hunting around to find words in other languages that English doesn't have an equivalent for. Um, so we're just uh, people from different cultures from all over the world, native speakers and linguists and comedians. And we're just gonna talk about um, uh, what, I've called, what I've learned is a lacuna, which means a gap in your own language. How do you spell that? L-A-C-U-N-A. A gap in your own language. Okay, I'm, I'm writing this down in the chat, everyone, because <laughs> we, we learned something today, right? Who knew, who knew what was lacuna? Lacuna was my gap. That was my gap in my own language. Um, so do you have an example of a word? Of just oh, yes, so many of them. Um, but one that I love is wabi-sabi. Uh, which is Japanese, and it's the beauty of imperfection. Uh -huh. We're trying to pick words that we feel like our perspective lacks, and especially in Los Angeles, where mm -hmm. I feel like it's about perfection and glamour and uh, being perfect and living up to an ideal. And what about a little something that's um, that's that's broken? I mean, there's so many Japanese ones, um, but uh, they have one that's even um, komarabi which is the filigree of light through the branches and trees above you that I would never Beautiful. even think about. But it's like, oh, there's some lovely kamarabi today. Uh, so the idea is to give voice and language to something uh, that is, is kind of nebulous. And by doing that, uh, create more of an appreciation for it. Love it. And how can we see that? When is that starting? And, and where should people go to see that? Well, um, I'd love to send out information to you. We're recording it next week. We're recording our first couple of ep episodes and then we're going to see what platform to get it up on. But I'm excited because this this weekend was like, we're like, we're doing it. It's time for 50 words to <laughs> snow. It's a, it's a great idea. It's a beautiful idea. And, and I love so much of what you're doing. And I think we all can just uh, uh, applaud you for your inspiration and your honesty. Oh my God, the honesty is so appreciated for anybody who's been through a mental health thing. You really, <laughs> it really, really, really is. Uh, it's just so, it's so vivid, but it, and it's just that reassuring that, that you're, you know, you're not alone. I think that's even somebody was talking about, that's one of the big things we all need to hear when we, when we're yeah. feeling down is we're not alone. So, and Joanna was not alone, which that's a great tribute to you. Um, and even though you don't want to be seen as noble, I think it is pretty noble. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you so much to everyone who came. And I, I should know if there's there any other questions, but if you want to unmute yourself and just give a little applause and thank you to Maggie for all that she's done. And we'll look forward to seeing what you do next. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeannie. This was really fun. Yes. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. That was great. Yes. Bye.